been new to Lifetime, you may not know um, how to initiate contact and start the conversation with us, the very first step would be our free application on the website, which is lifetimeadoption.com slash apply. You can fill out a free little application right there on the website, and that helps us understand who you are, kind of where you're coming from on things, and um, a little bit about what you're looking for in your adoption, and give us a good starting point to share more information and guidance with you as you explore adoption and possibly exploring adoption through Lifetime. Um, also, join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash open.adoption. Um, our question and answer phone lines are open right now. If you have a question more related to your specific circumstances, you can reach us by phone by dialing 1-800-923-6784. And you can also email adopt, A-D-O-P-T, at lifetimeadoption.com if you are more of an emailer, which is fine. We are great with email as well. Um, but if you already are, are um, on the journey with Lifetime, of course, you will have your phone coordinator you can reach out to. Remember, we have an open door policy. So when something's on your mind, you are welcome to call or email, especially when you have questions. We'd rather help you as you go rather than wait for them all to pile up. So um, thank you all for being here. And at that, I will turn it over to Libby. Great. Thank you, Kim. Um, we're excited about this webinar. We get a lot of questions that sort of scatter throughout each webinar. And a lot of them focus not only on transracial adoption, which would be adopting a child of a race different than your own. And so a lot of times what we've noticed is sometimes there's a focus on a Caucasian family adopting an African American baby. But this could be, I mean, really, it's just a child with background different than you or your families. And on that note, a lot of those questions also just cross over to any child that you raise through adoption. And so I think it's really wonderful to have three different adoptive moms here tonight that can speak from their family's experience. They all um, they all have their own stories of how they came to adoption and their own experiences. I love also that their children are all still young, but they're also in different stages um, of their own lives too. So you'll get a different perspective just with the phases of parenthood that each of these moms is going through. And so we really want to encourage you to type your questions and your comments and your feedback, um, whether you're thinking about adopting transracially or if you just have questions about how to talk to your child about adoption or about what open adoption is like when you know, a birth parent is a race different than your family is or whatever comes to mind, we'll try and include as many as we can tonight. So um, we also have some really sweet photos to show. And for those of you on the call who maybe have been following Lifetime's webinars or maybe you've looked back at past webinars, another really great thing I'd like to point out is just that each of these women has shared their story before. And so you may have even heard their whole story before. And now is a great time even for follow-up questions. Um, or you can go backwards and hear them tonight and go hear their entire story. And I believe you can find most of them at adoptionteleconference.com. And if you have trouble finding any of their stories and you want to hear their whole story, you can always write, um, send an email either to your coordinator if, you're already, if you already have one at Lifetime, or you can write, um, I would say, Kim, you're probably a good home base for that. So I will direct you to Kim. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't yet have a coordinator, you can write to Kim and say, hey, I heard I could listen to a webinar. How can I find it? And her email is kim at lifetimeadoption.com. So um, joining us tonight, I put up on the screen here, we have Wendy, Tricia, and Lori. And ladies, I know you're probably all going to say this at the same time, but welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to start, maybe give you an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. So, Wendy, let's let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about you and your family and maybe how you came to adoption. Okay. Um, my husband and I, uh, we have been trying to conceive for quite a while. And after a couple of years of that, we felt led to adopt. It was just heavy on both of our hearts. And so... We, uh, through a lady at our church, actually, we were um, pointed in Lifetime's direction. And uh, we contacted them, and we just 
we just felt very at home with them and knew that they had, um, you know, not only did they were going to take care of us, but they were going to take care of the adoptive mom, or excuse me, the um, birth mom, and I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. And so, anyway, we signed up with Lifetime officially, uh, I believe, in October, and 15 months later, we were um, we were chosen by our birth mom, Joanne, and uh, on Sarah's birthday, actually. Sarah was born on, well, she was born in January, and we were called that same morning that um, she was born, and so it was a drop in the lap situation. And ever since then, it's been pretty amazing, and we are so glad that we did it, and we would love to do it again. We've just been praying about how to do that. So, Cool. Okay, great. And then next, let's let's introduce Trisha. I'm going to pull up a photo here of you guys. So Trisha, tell us a little bit about your family and how you came to adoption. Okay, well, similarly to Wendy, Roger and I had tried for many years to get pregnant and we're not able to. So we also felt led to adopt. Unfortunately, we did not find lifetime right away. And we tried some other avenues, which did not work for us. And then we finally was um, introduced to lifetime. And we signed on officially in April. And we were matched with our birth mom in just a little under five months. And Katie was born seven months to the day of us signing our our contract with Lifetime. Mm. So this is a picture of her, and as of now, she's our only, and she's just about to turn six years old. Okay, great. Um, okay, and Lori, I'm going to pull up your family photo here. Here. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your family and what brought you guys to adoption. And you actually have two different adoption stories, so I know that that will bring a different perspective tonight as well. Right. Well, um, my husband and I were both single well into our 30s, and we were out on our first date, and he's the one who said to me, I just need you to know that I am called to adopt. I know I'm supposed to adopt from China, so I hope that's good with you if this relationship moves forward. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, a man who knows what he likes and um, knows what he's called to do and wanting to be obedient to that. So we did end up getting married and wanted to see if, I mean, we didn't know if we would be able to have children at all. And um, so the Lord blessed us with our firstborn, Gianna, within two years of being married. And then after that, we started the adoption process to China. And so um, Janessa is over on the left. She's eight years old now, and we adopted her a little over six years ago. So she was about 20 months old when we when she joined our family. We always thought we would go back to China. And when we started that process for another child, um, didn't feel peace about it. So we just stepped back and wanted to see what God would have for us. And in the meantime, Lifetime um, contacted us. We had reached out for them while we were waiting to go out from China. And so they were just doing a follow-up, and we did a conference call. I think it was with you, Kim, wasn't it? Most likely it was. <laughs> so I think we interviewed the heck out of Kim, and... Uh, <laughs> prayed about it and really had peace about signing on with Lifetime and so we did and then we waited and we waited a long time it felt like for us um, and I, I want to say it was over two years I don't even really remember because our lives were still really busy with the two girls but then we got a call in early August of 2007 that there was a little baby that had been born in July he could come early and the birth mom was looking for looking at different families and she ended up choosing us and on Labor Day in 2007 we received little Jaden at six weeks old. Mm. It's been wonderful. Thank you. So one of the questions we actually had submitted when we began uh, putting the word out about tonight's webinar, I, I'm going to try and paraphrase it, but I think I think it also makes tonight's call very relevant 
for the concerns that we know are common for adoptive parents when they're thinking about adopting a child of a race different than their own. But um, certainly we all know with the things we're seeing in the media, um, this comment says, we've really been trying to decide whether we have whether we have the preference or not to adopt a child of a different race, especially facing what race means in this country right now. We are most concerned by what the child is being different. So I'm curious if you could speak to how you came to decide what your preferences were. Because a lot of people get stuck in that initial phase. Oh my goodness, there are so many options. How do you know what we're open to? How did you decide your family was ready to be open to a child of any racial background? Well, this is Wendy. I can go first. Okay. Well, Glenn and I first started, we we were initially had a very narrow focus on our preferences, and we really prayed about it and prayed about it. And I don't know. It was just uh, one day I woke up and I said, "Honey, I think we really where she is." She was that was on her one year birthday. Uh, <laughs> I said, you know, I just really feel in my heart that we should open up our preferences. And this was about, we had been a, a lifetime family for a year. And we hadn't had any potential birth mom calls or anything like that. And I just said, you know, I feel really strongly about this. I feel that we should open it up to all races. And so we contacted Lifetime and we made that choice. And it basically boiled down to God just laid it on our heart. And any fears or questions that we had, about that, we just completely put them at rest, and that's how we came to be open to other races. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Lori, what about you guys, especially since you have um, two different experiences, like you said, you started in China and then you adopted from the U.S. Um, what was that like for you to decide, okay, because a lot of people, even when they have an international adoption, would think, okay, I at least want the two children I adopted to share race in common. And so you have three children with all different backgrounds. Yeah. <clears throat> I I don't know that we ever felt closed. Um, I, race was never even discussed. We just knew that God had given us a heart for kids and... Um, that he would see fit to put whatever children he wanted in our family if we were open to that. And so actually what we did, uh, we the only narrow focus we had on our preferences when we first signed on is we wanted another girl. We thought that we would be an all-girl family. And um, so that was kind of funny because race wasn't an issue. And, uh, we, and one of the things I think that helped us to feel maybe more confident in having a multiracial family was one of the requirements of our international adoption after she was placed with us is that we had to do some um, organized education and had to prove that we had done different online courses and stuff. And one of the classes that sticks out in my mind is one that was called the Conspicuous Family. And we live in a fairly diverse area, but it's not hugely diverse. And um, I remember we were on the computer, my husband and I, listening to this webinar, or this uh, educational piece about the conspicuous family. And uh, Gianna, my oldest, was walking by, and she asked, well, what are you doing? And so I paused it, because I thought, well, here's a teachable moment. And I said, well, we're, we're listening to this, it's talking about a conspicuous family. She's like, well, what would make our family conspicuous? <laughs> Which was just alarming to me that, you know, she has a sister that looks nothing like her. And, you know, Gianna was like seven or eight at the time that she asked this question. And so I, I didn't want to just lay it out there. So I said, well, Gianna, think about, think about our family and, and how we are when we're out and about. What might what might there be about our family that makes us conspicuous? What might some differences be between you and Janessa? And she sat for a second and she goes, her toes. Her toes are so different than mine. That's what's conspicuous. <laughs> and it was just one of those moments. I loved it because she didn't see that 
I have blonde hair and Janessa has black hair or her eyes aren't anything like mine. Her toes are what's, what Gianna saw as different. And that really struck a chord with Ryan and I because it was like, gosh, if that's, if that's how we could all see each other. And it's not, it's not the differences of how we look. And I'll, I'll talk more about another conversation we had when we were preparing for Jaden um, a little bit later. But it just, it was a really, uh, a learning moment for Ryan and I when that was her response to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so Tricia, what was your experience between you and Roger starting out as first time parents and deciding right out the gate, we're just open to, to a child of any background anyways. Well, we had definitely talked about it between the two of us and prayed about it and we also talked to our extended family and just got their perspective, not that that was going to make our final decision, but just to get their feelings and opinions because we wanted our child to be accepted with the whole family, of course. And so right out the gate with Lifetime, we decided to keep our preferences wide open. And we just believed that God would place us with the child that we were meant to have, and he definitely did. And there's a little bit of a funny story with Katie's birth, because when we were matched with the birth mom, she thought she was having a Caucasian male. Oh. And as you can see, neither one of them ended up being true. <laughs> but we're so thankful that we were completely open to whomever God had for us to be placed with because even though the birth mother was nervous, it didn't phase us at all. So. I, I'm so glad that you reminded us about that because here six years later, I can't imagine you with a different child. I mean, we get photos from you guys all the time, and it completely slipped my mind just because Katie is your child. I'm so used to how your story ended that I forgot that yeah. detail, but now that you bring it up, I do remember that. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, so what did, what's Katie's racial background? Is, is she biracial? She is biracial. Her birth mom is actually Caucasian, and her birth father is African American. Okay. And Wendy, what's your daughter's racial background? As far as I know, her mom is um, African American, and then her dad, we don't know any details about, but I, I'm just, we've always just kind of assumed that he was the same, but we don't have any of those details. And so, Lori, we know that your daughter is is from China, but your son, Jaden, what's his racial background? His birth mother is Filipino, African American, and we don't have any information on the birth father. Okay. Okay. Um, so, one of the questions I, I was asking Diane before the call, since she's worked with adoptive parents through the matches for so many years, one of the questions that we hear a lot is, how do I celebrate my child's culture? Um, and Lori, while we have you, I was going to bring up a photo just so we could see your two kids together here. Why don't you speak a little bit about, um, at this age, well, of course, Janessa's eight now, so I'm sure that you've had some talks with her. But now that you have such a diverse family, how do you, do you have different traditions to celebrate their unique cultural background, or what's that like in your family? That's a great question. One of the things that Ryan and I talked about is that we were going to just kind of um, leave it up to them as they grew older as to how much or how little they want to celebrate that. And, and so while we do weave some of it in, we don't you know, do this big, huge Chinese New Year or anything like that until Janessa starts expressing more interest in it. Um, she is just getting to that age, and she just turned eight, that um, she is asking a lot of questions and she really has a desire to go back to China, which we've told her we will. 
when she's probably between 10 and 12, uh, will be able to go back and visit her orphanage. And she asks a lot of questions uh, about the country. And, and at this point, is saying she may even want to go back and be a missionary there. Um, so for her, you know, like I was just looking up some Chinese lantern celebrations in November that we might go to that's, uh, you know, a Chinese celebration that we can all be involved in. She's also expressed a little bit of interest uh, in learning Mandarin, which we may uh, pursue for her. I, with Jaden, we haven't really introduced anything at this point. And um, as he gets a little bit older, we'll be as we when we start doing more with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's well, you said that. Well, actually, both of your adoptions were of babies that were already born. Was I hearing you right? That's correct. Okay, so that's unique too, um, since you didn't have a pregnancy necessarily to prepare for learning about this child's background and what are we going to do, you really adopted and then figured it out. Um, so what I was thinking though, you reminded me, I have a friend, she was adopted from Korea at birth, or well close to birth, she was probably almost a year, but um, she, she tells me, you know, sometimes people look at me and think I should have an Asian accent and they're surprised when I sound Texan because that's where I grew up. And for her, she just identifies as, I mean, she doesn't have any other identity. She doesn't identify with her cultural origin. So have you even had any of those questions or comments even from other people come up yet with your children where maybe they even look at your daughter and think, you know, expect something and then they're surprised when she's just an average little American girl? I, I haven't had any surprising comments. A lot of times people will come up and I, I think they're being a little bit too nosy and I, I always gauge my responses on what my kids are going to hear me saying and right? not really caring what, I'm gonna, what the person is asking um, because I always want my kids to know that I have their best interest at heart. But you know, people usually are really well-meaning and they'll come up and say, oh, is she, is she from China or where is she from? Um, and you know, I'll just respond, yeah, she was born in China. And well, did you adopt her? Well, why do you ask? You know, I just kind of put the question back on them. <laughs> but I haven't had anything that's been um, what I would say over the edge or offensive, or that would seem offensive to another culture. <laughs> thankfully. Mm -hmm. Great. I appreciate your insights on that. So. So Tricia, do you and Roger, you know, have anything in particular that you that you've started as a tradition to honor Katie's background? Um, we have done some things with the African culture. Katie actually really likes the music, and um, so you know we've gotten that for him when we get the opportunity to take part in some sort of cultural presentation or something, then we do take advantage of that. And I would say definitely one of the things that's very much her culture that we have had to take head on is her hair, which sounds interesting. But that was a huge learning curve for me to figure out how to take care of her hair. And that's a special bonding time with her and I because it is time consuming and it is very special about her. So Katie now is old enough where she gets to pick the different hairstyles that she wants and then we work on it together to figure out how to accomplish that. And also to seek advice um, from other African American women on things we can do to take care of her hair and, and how to style it. And um, so that's been a big part of what we've done so far with her. Well, and Wendy, Wendy, I know that you actually wanted to talk about that tonight too, and so I'm glad that you brought that up, Tricia. We actually had a question, and maybe we, before Wendy chimes in, we can have Tricia's input, and then we can get Wendy's side. So there was a question that said, "What resources did you use to learn to do her hair?" 
Um, I had some local friends who are African American women who have helped me. And there's also a lot of resources online. I just started Googling it, really. And there's also a book that I found that's very well written for those of us who are not used to taking care of it. And it's called Chocolate Hair Vanilla Care. And it is oh, yes. very basic. It is specifically written for Caucasian parents on how to take care of African American hair, and it has been very helpful in just learning the basics. Mm -hmm. So, Wendy, I know that you wanted to talk to this tonight, and I love the photos you actually sent going through this this process. Um, do you kind of identify with what Tricia was sharing? What's that like for you and Sarah um, to learn about the difference, even with hair care? Well, I have to tell you that I I came across Chocolate Hair Vanilla Care when Sarah was a baby, not even a couple months old. And the lady that runs that, her name is Rory, and she is just amazing. She has everything you need from infancy through childhood, from detailed to the very basic. She shares everything. She's very open. She has tons of YouTube videos. And I just said, okay. She's an infant. This is all I need to do. And then when the next thing comes, that well, that's what we'll do. But the biggest thing was is you know setting Sarah up and just starting a routine with her around six months, even though it was very simple. And at that age, detangling her hair was very easy. Now as her hair is getting longer, you know it takes longer, but it's a process. And it's like anything. Once you learn, you build on it, and you learn what works for you. You think about your schedule and how much time you want to spend on her hair. And then I also involve her in it, too. And that is, like Trisha said, it's a very big bonding time for us when we do her hair. And I always tell her afterwards how pretty she is and that she looks beautiful. And, and to hear her say that back to me is, is like the best thing in the world. So. Oh. <laughs> so the photo I, I on the left you. is, I'm um, yeah. sorry, the photo on the left was, um, Easter after she was a year, and then the photo on the right was actually adoption day, where we went to the courthouse. So, um, does do you have anything you want to add to? I know I know she's two and a half, so it's sort of limited, but you can do at this point. But have you and Glenn talked about, you know, anything you want to put into your family's traditions as she grows up to honor the differences in your backgrounds, or uh, what's that like for your family so far? Well, early on, I asked uh, her birth mom, Joanne, I asked her, I said, you know, is there anything, any tradition that, because she's parenting other children, and so I asked her, I said, is there anything around birthdays or holidays or special time of the year that you would like us, you know, to incorporate for Sarah? And she said, no, not really. And so Glenn and I just kind of decided, well, wait. I think, like Lori said, um, when she's a little bit older and she starts to be interested in that. But because she's from down south around the Mardi Gras area and with the time she was born, we incorporate a king cake for her birthday every year. And then you incorporate we love. love. It's called a king cake, K-I-N-G. Oh, yes. yes. And it's tied in with Mardi Gras and, and with Christmas. And so we, we tie that in with her birthday. And then we also love Cajun food, and she's from the down in the Cajun area. And so ours is initially just going to center mostly around food until she gets older. And of course, her keeping her hair as natural as possible is very important to me as well. I, I love that you brought that up about asking her birth mother, because I think you that's such a great tip whether you adopt a child who shares race in common with you or you adopt an older child or a newborn or a child of a different race. Um, I love that because it's not just about racial culture. It's also about her birth culture, her birth history, and just celebrating and being able, as she grows up, to say, we do this because your, your birth mom was from here or there, and that's what she did. Or, I, I love that idea of just even asking her. I could imagine a birth mother feeling very included just to even be asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, it, 
it kind of brings me to, I also wanted to make sure that we talk tonight because a really big question that we get asked about is um, just how we, how do you talk to your children about adoption? And we are always encouraging people these days, you know, modern day adoption, you know, all of the studies really show that you should be talking about adoption from day one in some way, whether it's reading a story or telling the child their own story um, on an age appropriate level in a positive way. Um, so, so Wendy, since we have your pictures up, let's work backwards here and we'll start with you. And then um, I want to hear from each of you. How do you talk to your child at this stage about adoption or about how your family came together through adoption? How are you making that a normal word in your house? Sure. I would like to say that we put together a scrapbook for the first, I would say, year, year and a half of Sarah's life. And we have that set out. And every once in a while we go through it with Sarah and we tell her about it. You know, she's not old enough because she's only two and a half. She doesn't quite understand. But the other day she said to me, Mommy, you know, and she looked at her arm and she looked at my arm and she said, what color is your arm? And so I said, my arm is white. And she said, my arm is brown. And I said, yeah, it is. And I said, that's because you were adopted. And she just kind of looked at me. And we also have a great book called On the Night You Were Born, I believe. And we, we read that at nighttime sometimes. And that just kind of goes over adoption as well. And I think the biggest thing is just, you know, kids don't care what color your skin is. And they get the, you know, they learn from society that, there's certain colors that are bad or that there's a ranking of colors. And so, you know, that's just my biggest thing is just to always, you know, teach her and then my loved ones and the people that I'm around every day in my life that, you know, let's not let's keep the colors all equal and beautiful. And so that's my big thing is, you know, to let her know that she's loved and that her color is equal to everyone else's and that she's beautiful. And if I've done that, if we've done that, then we've, you know, done what we wanted to do. That's beautiful. And I know that, well, actually, you posted earlier this afternoon just that that is your passion. And I was I was touched, and I, I hope that you were touched, although you probably weren't as surprised because you live with these people. But, I mean, I was so moved by the comments of support you had posted about how you just hoped that you would be a help and a resource on tonight's webinar because this topic is so near and dear to your heart. Um, and it was just beautiful to see the people you know, the friends on your Facebook page just chiming in, yeah, you know, you guys are an amazing family. And I know that is a huge um, hurdle for a lot of people when it comes to considering adoption in general, but especially when they're thinking about adopting a child that it's going to be more obvious that right. that child was brought into the family through adoption is how is my immediate circle and certainly how is my community going to embrace that or make it challenging. Um, and it was just wonderful to see how they're all behind you. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a Midwest town. My husband grew up from the West Coast. And so when I grew up, I was pretty sheltered. And, you know, people were probably labeled as racist. And then we lived, because the Air Force took us to so many awesome places, we spent the last 20 years in Southern California. And there it's a very different culture. And so when we moved recently moved back, to the Midwest, that's kind of where we've experienced some of the the negative, the negativity, but nothing that has been, you know, overly rude or, you know, it's just different comments and different glances. And so, you know, I, I'm working on, and I think it was Lori who said, you know, you always want to respond to people inquisitive in their in their comments and they're being nosy in a loving way because you know, your daughter hears that, your, child, your son hears that. But, you know, you also have to stand up for your children, too. And so, you know, I, I work on that as well. But my big thing is is that we're all, you know, we're all pretty, we're all equal in God's eyes. He created us all equal. He thinks we're beautiful. And why should we make a big deal about the color? And so, you know, I'm still, I don't have the best thing to say off the top of my head yet, but I'm working on it. But my biggest thing is I do respond in love if I can, you know, and to just say, hey, you know, when someone says, oh, you're her mother, and I said, yeah, I'm her mother. And they just kind of, they don't know what to say. And to piggyback that, I also was concerned about my family, you know. But they said, Wendy, we don't care. You know, we'll love 
no matter what what child you have, we will love it. And it has been that, you know, they have been so loving and embracing of Sarah, and I couldn't have asked for a more loving family for her. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, Tricia, you actually, you live in Southern California, so you have a different experience. Um, yes. How do you, since you have six years of doing this now, I know that just in, in the updates that you shared, Katie, Katie seems pretty familiar from the start, just that you're proud of how your family came together through adoption. So what tips would you give other people who are wondering, okay, how am I going to talk about adoption once I bring that child home? Yes, we also had some concern with some extended family, especially since I just had shared that we thought we were bringing home a Caucasian male, and <laughs> so that was a very last minute switch, and we weren't sure what the response was going to be when we got home. And Roger and I had the blessing of being able to spend two weeks with Katie's birth mom while Katie was in the hospital at birth without any extended family with us. So it was just the three of us at the hospital and then and or one of us would be with the birth mom. So we had a long time to just think about how we were going to handle things and how were we going to respond to people before we got thrown back into it in Southern California. And I have to say, I think they just took their lead from us. We are very, very excited. We waited 12 years for a child, so Katie is a huge blessing in our lives. And um, nobody in the family really had any issues with it because of our positive attitude about it. And I think the same goes for Katie now that she's in school. And I know we get questions when I go to help in the classroom. The kids will be like, you're Katie's mom? And I said, yes, I'm Katie's mom. And they're like, oh. So, you know, they're kind of thinking about how is that possible. And um, I asked Katie, I said, what do you tell your friends if they ask you why your skin is a different color than mommy's or how I could be your mommy? And she just said to me this week, she goes, I just tell them God made us all different, and you can be a family any way you want to be. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> so I would say she's come a long way in six years. But to start with, besides just taking the lead from us, um, I used to laugh when she was a tiny baby. People used to ask me if we were going to tell her she was adopted. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, I really think she's going to figure it out sooner than later. <laughs> so, no, we never hid it from her. We had lots of children's books that we read to her from the very beginning, even though she wasn't old enough to understand them. They are always on the coffee table, and um, it's just always been a part of, you know, what we our daily routine, and it's part of our story, and we're happy to share it with people. So... Um, we have gotten a few weird comments or questions over the years or people being nosy and again I agree with just responding in love especially if Katie's standing there you know we want her to take her lead from us and it was interesting I was a little nervous the first time we traveled to the south because I wasn't sure how the African-American people were going to accept that we had basically adopted one of theirs. And I was pleasantly surprised that they were extremely welcoming. They always dote on her. They always talk about her hair, which, of course, makes me feel very relieved because <laughs> it's something new for me to take care of. And um, they, you know, I was just pleasantly surprised. As far as at home, the other thing that's important to us is for her to have friends who are mixed race or African American descent, and um, that way um, she's she is the only one in her class at school, but there are others in her school, and there was other friends that she had in preschool that were the same race that she was, and some of them were also adopted. So that's um, 
that's good too. She actually now has cousins on two sides of our family that are adopted. So that's always a good go-to also when she's struggling a little bit, you know, that we always tell her she's adopted. That means she was chosen and that she is very loved. When you say that, this is Kim King, when you say that maybe she has some moments where she's struggling a little, I think that's what weighs on adoptive parents' hearts when they're trying to figure out what direction to take or what to be open to. Can you share a little bit more about, you know, of course, respecting her story and her experience, but anything you can share that maybe adoptive parents can think about and how they would approach that with their child-to-be? Um, I think sometimes we had a few moments over the summer, like I said, she's almost six and she understands and I think sometimes it's just an internal struggle. It might not have even been anything culturally, but just the fact that she's adopted and she will say things like, um, you're, you know, you're not my real mom, I want to see um, I want to see my real mom or just something like she's trying to get kind of back at me a little bit or struggling with it and she just wants to see what my response is going to be and um, I know I've heard from other adoptees who are older that sometimes they just feel like they were given up once and is it going to happen to them again so my response is always to absolutely reassure her that we are for a forever family, that we are absolutely never letting her go, that we are in this together, and that I'm on her side, and that I will help her any way I know how, or if I need to get her help to, you know, help her with her feelings, that absolutely we will do that. Unfortunately, in our case, our our birth mom is not. Um, communicating with us right now. So seeing her, talking to her is not possible, but I made sure when we did have communication with her that I wrote down everything about her that I, I could gather um, that she would tell us and that we knew about her so that when Katie is struggling with that, we can talk about things that were special about her and how much she loved Katie and why she wanted what was best for Katie and um, that usually helps. And I actually found a children's book, um, the title sounds backwards of, of what we want to teach her, but the book is called You're Not My Real Mother and it's actually the photo on the front is a Caucasian mother with an African American child so it happens to be you know visually what we are. And so the girl kind of struggles in the book, and at the end she comes to realize that her adoptive mom, you know, is her real mom, and she also has a birth mom, which, you know, Katie knows. So that book has also helped Katie to just kind of deal with some of her struggles, and, you know, she comes, she came through, and um, so we just kind of deal with it when it comes up and it just happens once in a while and just always respond in love and with positivity and and any information that she wants sometimes when she does that she wants maybe just a little bit more information about her story to help her to figure out you know what she's feeling and that it's normal and that we're going to do this I, together I, I can see too you know some some adoptive parents might respond defensively, like like get or maybe too zealous in explaining how accepted and how how loved, like making it maybe too reassuring and because they're feeling threatened. And what I'm uh. hearing in your response is that her questions don't threaten your motherhood to her at all. You know, you right. You can hear those, and, and all it brings to mind is I have friends with kids about the same age, and they're kind of hitting the phase, even though their children weren't adopted, they're hitting the phase of, you know, I like daddy better than you, or I hate you, mom, like the things that they're testing their parents, um, yes. their, their trust level and security in the family, and they're trying to figure out their place in this life, um, but yes. especially when a child has an adoption story, I do, mm -hmm. I do 
think it's important to just recognize that there's going to be some additional questions and not to get scared of those or threatened of those, but I, I love that you threw out that book because it's the same thing what we find at Lifetime. You know, you're not supposed to say, give baby away, but one of our most popular resources says, you might think I could never give my baby away, but that's because we're trying to recognize what someone's saying and thinking and then address how it's not it's not really that and, and to show them the positive side of that and the truth about that and that's what you're doing with Katie. Um, I love that you spoke to that and I, I would love even to hear because like Lori, you have two children, different ages, different stories um, and you mentioned earlier there was something you were going to share about Jaden um, but is anything that Trish has shared, have you gone through that yet with either of your kids? Um, uh, yeah, good question. Not with Jaden. He's not quite old enough to start expressing stuff like that. But the interesting thing that's happened with us is with Janessa's adoption, of course, in China, there is no information on birth parent at all. And Janessa and Gianna were with us when we went to Las Vegas and Jaden was placed with us. So they met the birth mom and the grandma and the birth mom's younger brothers and you know, so they were very much a part of it, and so following that and our continued uh, interaction with Jaden's birth mom, Janessa asks questions like, well, Mom, when you met my birth mom, why couldn't she keep me? And, and you know, we keep telling her the same story at age appropriate. She's been asking, you know, for the last two or three years. And we always keep it very age appropriate. But just this last week, we were out on a walk together, just me and the girls. And Jan Janessa started talking about going back to China again. And so I said, "Well, honey, what, what do you what do you look forward to most about going back to China?" And she said, "Well, I want to see where I used to live." And I said, "Yeah, I said I think that you will. I think it will be a good thing to go there. And I, and I bet that the nannies will be really excited to see you." And she said, I really wish I could see my birth mom. And I said, honey, I wish you could too, but you know that that's probably not ever going to be able to happen. And she said, I just really want to talk to her. And I said, well, what would you want to say? And she said, like an eight-year-old would, she said, I want to ask her what she's been doing for the last eight years. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I said, well, that's a great question. And I said, I think that what you should do is start writing her a letter and just kind of, I just want her to really be able to put down her questions, even though they'll never be answered. I want her to face those so that when we do travel there, um, when we go to her orphanage, she can take those with her and you know, we might leave them at her finding place and do something special with her name and Chinese characters there or something to honor her birth mom. You know, every year we always on her birthday we make sure and honor her birth mom for making a decision that was very hard but to make sure that she was going to be safe and take, well taken care of. Um, so for her, it just opened up a lot more questions and we just try to deal with them because she doesn't really get it that her birth mom in China would have been arrested and taken to jail for doing what she did. And we keep telling her that, and you know, one day she'll get it. But um, it, it has opened a lot of questions because with Jaden's birth mom, we have a very open relationship and we text all the time. And you know, I'll shoot her a picture of him if he's doing something new or a short little video. And, and I, let me take that back. It's not all the time. I could go three months without hearing from her, and then you know, she'll pop a question out and. Um, you know, so, but it's a very open, uh, comfortable relationship. She doesn't over, I don't feel like she oversteps and I give her in, enough information that she knows that he's in a great place. Uh, the story I wanted to share because it, it talks a lot about preparing your family for um, a mixed race family is when we first found out about Jaden, Ryan and I kept it very quiet because we had just gone through a, a pretty difficult situation with another adoption situation. And it was still very raw on our hearts. And, and Gianna and Janessa had been um, 
involved in. We were Skyping with this little boy, so they had a face with a name and, you know, had talked with him. He was, he was a little bit older. And so when that fell through, you know, we were still healing and seeking the Lord to say, you know, what, what are we to do when we, when we found out about Jaden? And so we decided we weren't going to say anything until we had definite plans, until we knew we'd been chosen and we had a travel date and, <laughs> and that things were moving forward. And so we sat the girls down and, and explained to them that there was a young girl in high school that had chosen us to be the parents and the family for her little baby boy. And so Gianna's out of defense, the oldest, um, she just said, no, we're done. We're good with just Janessa. We're, we're, our family's complete. <laughs> and uh, we just said, well, we, we get why you feel that way. Your heart hurts, and so does ours. But we need to be obedient and follow what the Lord has and see, see what doors he's going to open. And this could not happen, but it could happen, and we need to follow through with it. And so she started asking questions about him because we didn't have a very good picture of him. We just had a, a photocopy of a picture of him in the hospital. That's all we had. And it was very blurry. You couldn't really see. And so she started asking questions and asked about his birth mom. And so I said, oh, she's, she's a, in high school. She wants to graduate from high school. She's a cheerleader. And she's beautiful. She's so cute. And, well, what color is her skin? Which surprised me that that's what Gianna asked. And I said, well, she's, she's got really beautiful brown skin and long, black, curly hair. And Gianna paused for a minute. She said, Mom, I don't know how I feel about having a brother with brown skin. As she's sitting next to her sister with slightly brown skin, it was, it was kind of funny. And um, I, I acknowledged that. And I said, well, we definitely would have a very colorful family, wouldn't we? And both of the girls are sitting, thinking. And, and it was one of those moments where you just pray, God, give me words, because I don't know what to say here. And I really felt like he came through because he. I asked them, I said, I want you to talk to me, tell me things about our family that you think makes our family special. And so G Gianna named a couple few things, and then Janessa named a couple few things. And I said, now listen, you, you heard what each other said. Did either of you say that our family is special because... Gianna has blonde hair like mommy, or blue eyes like her daddy, or Janessa has black hair like daddy, and um, brown eyes like mommy. I said, that had nothing to do with why our family is special. Let's talk about what family is. And we reiterated, family is about being loved unconditionally and always feeling secure and safe and knowing you always have a place in that family. And then, and this was really God, um, I said, think about a rainbow. Think about the colors in a rainbow. Is there any one color in the rainbow that makes it pretty? Or is it all of the colors in the rainbow that makes a rainbow magnificent? And they said, well, it's all. You can't pick one color. And I said, and that's exactly what our family would be. It's beautiful like a rainbow because of the colors in it. And um, it was beautiful. That's amazing. Well, and I love that you brought that up because Talking about adoption with children doesn't just mean the children who have adoption stories. Right. There are many. There are many people in our audience. I know even right now who are already raising biological children, and maybe they're waiting to adopt, or they're thinking about adopting a child, or starting the process. Or I know there's even some families in the audience tonight who have already brought a child home, and that conversation doesn't stop once you bring the child home, that there may be things that come up, again, even with your biological children, to just help them understand the choice your family made and what adoption really is, because they're all kids. You can't expect them to digest it in the same way that adults do. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad you brought that unique perspective, too. Um, and both of my girls have said that they, when they get married, they want to adopt. Oh. Yeah. And so you were saying, now do you have an open adoption with Jaden's birth mother? Yes, we do. Okay. So, and I know you were talking about the differences and how that causes your daughter to have questions too. Um, and Trisha, you brought up, you don't actually have contact, and I love the way you talked about handling that. Um, when what We had a great question for Wendy earlier that said, they wanted to know what your um, 
what your openness is like with Sarah's birth mother. Uh, sure. Actually, when we flew to meet Sarah, um, the first thing that we did was go visit her birth mom first because when Sarah was born, her birth mom didn't want to see her or hold her. She wanted her to immediately go to the nursery because, you know, she knew that if she held her, she would change her mind. And I can't even imagine, you know, how, how, that, how that was. So we wanted to respect her, and we went and spent, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes with her. We offered her to help us name Sarah because, you know, we had names picked out, but we wanted to give her that choice too, and she didn't want to have any part of that. And she said she wasn't open to keeping in touch with us, and that, you know, kind of broke my heart. So we said, okay, but, you know, she... She didn't have any transportation, and she was she's very poor. And we just offered up, we said, anything that we have while we're here, because we had to stay there for almost a month to get approval to come back home. And so we said, we have a rental car, you know, anything that you need. And so she wanted to go home right away, and, and Sarah had to stay for a full 48 hours. So we offered to take her home. So we took her home. And then, uh, unfortunately... Uh, they, the hospital made her come back when Sarah was being discharged, and that's a whole other story. Uh, so we went and we got her, and we brought her back to the hospital, and she got the discharge papers, and she said, she's not my daughter, she's yours, Wendy. And so we, we all went together in the car, and we left together, and um, I dropped Sarah and Glenn off, and we went and took care of some insurance things, me and Joanne. And then a couple of days after that, we took her to meet with a social worker because in Mississippi, birth moms have 10 days from the time they sign, acknowledging what their options are. They have 10 days. They come back. They decide what they're going to do. And during that 10 days, I was still in touch with her, and I wanted to take her out to lunch, but it never really panned out. And then that 10th day, I took her back to the social worker, and she, you know, the whole time she kept encouraging me, Wendy, I'm really not going to change my mind. I know you're stressing about this, but I'm not going to change my mind. I know I've made the best choice. And so after all of that, I said, I know that you don't want to keep in touch. I said, but would you just mind if I snap a few pictures of you? And so she let me take a few pictures of her. And then on the conversation on the way back to her home, I said, you know, if you ever change your mind, I said, we're here for you. You can be silent for months, for years, but we'll be here for you. And she said, you know what, Wendy, I would like to keep in touch. And so we don't have a really close relationship, but I can text her. We have a private Facebook page where I post videos and, and photos of Sarah. She texts me whenever she wants. We send her birthday gifts. We send her Christmas gifts. You know, on Sarah's birthday, we acknowledge her and the gift that she's given us. So even though it's not a close relationship, it's definitely open, and she is open to talking to Sarah when Sarah's, you know, 16, 17, 18, and she says she'd answer any questions that Sarah had. So what turned out to be something that was going to be closed ended up being open, and it could change again, but for right now it's open. Hmm. I would love, um, gosh, Kim, you were right. This hour's just flown. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> I was thinking maybe before we wrap up, um, I think that you, I think you all touched on it, but I, I'm always fascinated by why birth mothers, like the reasons a birth mother chooses particular families, and especially when it comes to transracial adoption. I mean, these, these women see your profile, so it's not like they're deceived about your racial background or your family um, and where you stand. I would love to hear from each of you as to any reason that you recall why your child's birth mom picked your family, maybe what stood out, because I think that one of the main concerns that a, a lot of Caucasian families in particular have is well, we're open, but we've heard that birth mothers want to choose adopted parents who have race in common with their child. And so I would love to hear what what led your child's birth mom to you. What made you stand out to her and move forward? So, um, Wendy, while we're, while we're on with you, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go to Tricia and back to Lori. Okay, sure. Sure. Um, we asked Joanne that when we met with her, that, 
very first night. And she said, I said, did you watch your video? She said, no. I said, did you see our website? She said, no. <laughs> and I said, how did, you, how did you find us? And she said, well, you know, I called Lifetime, and they sent me a package of, proof of these profile things. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, I read through a few of them, and she said, then I got to yours and Glenn's, and I just felt connected to you. She said, you know, I always want my children to go to church, but I'm really never able to take them. And you and Glenn, that is obvious in your profile that that's a huge part of your life. And she said, I always wanted to be a nurse. And she said, Wendy, you're a nurse. And she said, I just, you know, she's like those two things. And she said, I, she's like, I just felt connected to you. And, and that's, you know. I said, okay, well, you know, because I, you know, you want to know, and so I couldn't, I couldn't hold back. I had to ask, and that's what she said. So, um, but I don't know. And, and she also hid her, her, hid her pregnancy from her family, and so she gave up a lot to do what she did for adoption. So, um, you know, I just, we're just so blessed, and I just, I cherish those conversations with her so much, and I replay them in my head all the time, and. Um, Anyway, I hope that helps somebody that's listening. So, I love that because I really think that that could be any birth mother, that there was something even about you that just because of her own goals, you stood out and she identified with that and learned more and then obviously made a real, a real connection there. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. I just love all the different reasons there are. So, Tricia, how about you guys? Well, we... We asked her also, she also contacted Lifetime and she received 15 profiles and she said she looked through them and she chose us because she liked our smiles on the professional photo that was on the front of the profile and she loved that we were very involved with church. And she had grown up going to church, but wasn't going currently, and really wanted that for her child. Now, of course, the race difference would be a little different in our situation because she was convinced she was having a Caucasian meal, so that wasn't part of it at the time. But she also requested that we meet her in person before she made her final decision. So we did make that happen, what turned out to be two weeks before Katie was born, and that kind of solidified her decision in choosing us when we met with her in person. And then um, when she um, went into labor extremely quickly and had Katie um, three hours later, so we did not get there in time, so when she called us on the phone, it was kind of with fear and trepidation that we had a girl and not a boy, and that the pediatrician had verified that Katie is half African American. And so she kind of posed it to us as a question, like she was afraid we were going to turn the car around and head home, that would we still accept her? And we told her from the get-go, we don't care if she's purple with green spots, it does not matter to us what color she is, which race or which gender, I mean, and so I think that released some of her fears that we would continue the trip to the hospital to come see her and, and still adopt Katie. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love that because we have had experience before where a baby is born a different gender than expected or a different race um, or sometimes even different health conditions, although that's usually a little bit more rare, but that is usually the number one concern is will my baby be accepted? And a, a lot of birth mothers share that concern even while they're just pregnant, um, even if they're choosing a family who could easily be their own extended family. They still wonder, you know, because my child will be adopted into your family, you know, I just want to have the assurance that they will be accepted and loved and embraced. And I love that she expressed that to you and that you could just you could just put her heart at ease. Um, it, I mean, it, it doesn't happen very often that you get as surprised as Roger and Tricia did, but it does happen. Um, and it's worth it's worth thinking about what you would do. What would you do if your baby was born 
a different race than expected? Would you feel called to continue the adoption or would you feel as if you were just a stepping stone and that that was another family's child? You know, every adoptive parent is going to have to go through that hypothetical question. Um, so, so Lori, how about how about you? Do you um, do you remember with Jaden's birth mom what stood out about you and Ryan? She, I, we asked her actually, and she had a hard time pinpointing anything. But I think that I'll go back to our initial conversation that we had with her over the phone, and she had obviously written down a list of questions to interview us. Uh, and interestingly, before she contacted Lifetime, she was working with a different agency, apparently. And um, when she went into labor early, we're not sure what happened, but something happened, and she switched and called Lifetime. And we're like, thank God. <laughs> we're so happy about that. Um, so she, she asked questions about our faith, about our involvement in church, about what kind of church we went to. Uh, and asked a lot of questions about the girls. And just knowing a little bit about her family, she comes from a family with, she's the only girl, and she's got four brothers. And um, I I just gather, because she, she, when we asked her, she had a hard time pinpointing any one thing. But I think that it was our faith and our involvement in church and that he would have siblings is what, really drew her to us and then she did say that you guys are just so nice and you know, she because she's just the sweetest little thing and she you know you guys are just so nice and um, so I think that those those things all together are what had her choose us that's awesome Kim Kim I know you've been typing with people behind the scenes too before we wrap up is there anything you wanted to ask the ladies before we... Yes, there off? is. I was hoping that we could do another round table with each of you and find out if there was any piece of advice you'd like to give to future adoptive parents. Um, it could be a piece of advice that you, the one thing that you would want them to know or feel confident about, or um, it could be something that you learned on your own that you wished you would have known in advance that really helped you. Um, everyone has access to the internet and YouTube, which is such a wealth of information, so maybe there might have been something that you figured out on your own, even doing all the research in the, in the world, you still figured out some things on your own. Um, this is Wendy. I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is to piggyback on what Libby said, is know your heart and know what you, you know, be prepared because things do change. And if you're truly ready for a drop in the lap, like we were, you got to have your ducks in a row. And so we had gone, every six months we went through a drill. I had a checklist. We had a diaper bag packed, half blue, half pink. So that when we got the phone call, we were literally within two hours ready to go. And so, and then the second thing would be is to, no matter what, just, you know, respect and honor birth mom. So I think... Those are the big two things, you know, just really be ready, even though you're sitting and waiting, and it could be many, many months, or it could be quickly, and then just honor your your child's birth mother from, from the very beginning. Uh -huh. I love that tip. Um, Lori, how about you? How would you answer that? I think the biggest um, piece of advice I would give would be continue living life. I know it's hard when you're waiting um, for this huge addition to your life, um, but continue living your life. So whether it means you don't have kids in your home already and you're desperately wanting one, make your marriage as best as it can be. Do things that you can do now before you have kids because life changes once you have kids. If you already have kids, pour into the kids you have as you're waiting for that new addition that you know God has called you to adopt. But don't sit and tread water um, and just let time pass by while you're waiting for this one piece of your puzzle because you have all those other pieces of your puzzle to tend to as well. Uh -huh. And Tricia, how about you? What, what would you pass along? What wisdom would you pass along? I think the biggest lesson for us in our 
whole adoption story was that God's timing and his child for you is perfect. So not only did we go through several miscarriages, but we also had several failed adoption attempts before Katie. And looking back, I can see everything we went through was preparing us for, for to be Katie's parents and that we just had to wait for her to be there for us. So none of these other things were meant to be, and even though it was hard to go through at the time, I can see that you know the wait was, was hard, but it was worth it. And so one of my favorite things tell Katie now is that she was worth every day of the 12 year wait that we had for her through. And so I know it can feel very struggling and there was times during those years that we thought it just wasn't meant for us to be parents or something wrong with us or but it was the timing and the perfect child for us. Absolutely. Thank you. Those were all beautiful answers. We have all these comments coming in about, oh, that's how I feel. That's great advice. Um, we had a few people commenting just on how amazing you all are just to come on and share your experience and help these people who aren't even who aren't even waiting yet, and then all the way to people who are actually matched, and then those of you on the call who have already welcomed your child. So we're so grateful for all of your stories and experience and your tips. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. And Kim, is there anything you you want to throw in before we add? I know we've had some great questions come in. I think we've touched on most of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is definitely a conversation we need to keep going. So if you had any questions on your mind about transracial adoption, please email those to either myself or Libby. My email is kim at lifetimeadoption.com. And of course, if you reply to a webinar invitation, you will get Libby. Um, but definitely let's keep this conversation going and maybe reconvene and get more perspective and more answers, too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, Tricia, Lori, and Wendy, thank you for being here tonight. And to all of you who attended, I know it was a, a little different time than usual, which I love because it keeps us on our toes. Um, we're thankful for your participation and your questions. And um, for those of you also who wanted to know a little behind the scenes, we had um, Wendy's husband, Glenn, was also chiming in with some comments um, behind the scenes, too. So that was really fun just to see him relive their family story, too, and you know, help her with everything Wendy was sharing. So it was really sweet. Um, we will meet with all of you again on a webinar very soon. And again, if you have questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. So let your coordinator know or reach out to us. Um, you can always email, generally speaking, adopt at lifetimeadoption.com, and they usually get it to the right person. So, um, we hope to see you on our next webinar, and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, ladies. Bye-bye. Thank you.